Hello, good evening. And thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Liat Margolis, and I'm the director of the Master of Landscape Architecture program here at Daniels. Uh, and it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to welcome our illustrious uh, panel this evening. And also to thank my uh, co-organizing in this special event, uh, Kelly Snow, Jane Welsh, Jane Wenninger um, of Toronto City Planning. Before we begin tonight's event, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of, of Toronto operates and recognize the First Nations territory on which we have gathered today. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Pitoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with the One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, Toronto is still the home to many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we're incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to, to work, live, and meet on this territory. This land acknowledgement is highly relevant to tonight's theme and challenging questions concerning the relations between humans and the environment, between uh, different knowledge systems, governing structures, and city building practices, and between evidence-based planning and adaptation to increase urbanization and climate change. Questions all of which have become increasingly important uh, to the field of landscape architecture. Inevitably, wildness, connectivity, and diversity are questions that concern environmental, but also social dimensions, beliefs, and practices. What are the means by which we can make public more aware and engaged? How do we ensure ecological health as well as social equity? And what are the metrics by which we measure success? Needless to say, such complex, uh, complex issues require cross-disciplinary exchange and multi-sectoral collaborations. Tonight's event brings together a number of fields and research areas to begin to explore these issues as they relate to municipal strategies that are intended to inform planning, design, and management of our urban environments. Tonight's event is a collaboration between the Landscape Architecture Program of Toronto City Planning and was organized in conjunction with the launch of the Draft Biodiversity Strategy of Toronto, which will take place tomorrow, a workshop with uh, over 100 scientists, policymakers, and city building professionals. Uh, this draft is Toronto's first biodiversity strategy and is intended to position Toronto as one of the urban leaders in conserving and increasing urban biodiversity. This document represents a collaborative process with multiple city departments, conservation authorities, universities, environmental groups, biodiversity experts, and citizen scientists, and is a testament, if I may say so, to city planning's continued uh, efforts in promoting ecologically healthy environments and increased public access and awareness to nature. Um, I'd like to commend my colleagues for, uh, at City Planning for this great achievement uh, and invite uh, one of the project leaders to give some context uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, Kelly Snow is a policy planner for the Environmental Planning Unit in the Strategic Initiatives, Policy and Analysis sections of Toronto City Planning. Over the last 15 years, Kelly led a number of important initiatives on environmental development guidelines and public awareness campaigns on birds in the urban environment, road ecology and biodiversity. And Kelly's also a lecturer at Ryerson School of Urban and Regional Planning and UTSC Department of Human Geography. So please give me a hand in uh, welcoming Kelly up to the stage. Thank you, Leah. I have no notes. Okay, 
Um, my name is Kelly Snow, uh, and it's a privilege to be here. I um, work, as Liat mentioned, for Toronto City Planning in the Environment section, and I'm with uh, I'm one of the leads on the city's biodiversity strategy, which we are uh, holding a workshop on tomorrow. And I'm with two of my friends and colleagues, Jane Wenninger and Jane Welsh, who are here. And um, as I mentioned, we are working on this, uh, the draft um, biodiversity strategy for the city, the, the genesis of which is really uh, is found in our, what we call the, um, City of Toronto's Biodiversity Series, which some of you uh, are familiar with. Here's one, Trees, Trees, Shrubs, and Vines of Toronto. And so we've done uh, books like this on uh, different taxonomic groups in order to help um, raise awareness uh, in, in the public's eye as to what non-human species they share the, 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 their city with and, and help cultivate a sense of stewardship in them and get them off the couch and put away the PlayStation, you know, maybe get outside and, and try and find this in, in their environment. So um, we've been working on this since uh, 2009. There's nine books and uh, several people here tonight have, uh, I can see in the audience, have helped with this. It's, a, it's a, uh, an effort in citizen science and, and, and collaboration with volunteers and it's been a really, really well, fulfilling project in terms of the work we do um, and innovative in, in, for, for us at City Planning. Um, one of the people that helped us uh, very, uh, very much uh, is here tonight, Scott McIver, an assistant, associate, assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He is a um, an urban ecologist specializing in pollinators. Okay, uh, he's an expert in green roofs. Uh, he likes. He's interested in the translation of of uh, these uh, types of um, ideas into policy. And so, I think he can fill in the blanks where I've left out. <laughs> Sorry, Scott, but I'll bring, I'll invite him up. He's going to be our moderator this evening, and I'll leave these books on the table here uh, for you guys. And uh, just I'll invite Scott up to. Welcome, Scott McIver, our, our moderator for this evening. <laughs> thanks, Kelly. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here as well. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. I've actually also spent uh, a number of years teaching here at the Daniels faculty as well, so it's a pleasure to be here in the new building. Um, without getting too deeply into that, I want to kick right into the, the time we have for the panel discussion. Um, you can see, <laughs> my phone's on, geez. Uh, you can see uh, from this image here, uh, biodiversity is represented uh, in a number of ways, shapes, colors, sizes, all these great things. Uh, we were looking at this image earlier and noticed it's kind of on its side. Uh, one perspective might be that we hope to kind of flip the way we think about biodiversity in the city on its head, and we're kind of halfway there, and after we get through the panel and certainly the time for discussion with the audience, uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to flip this right the way around and really start to think critically about how we want to uh, integrate biodiversity as a strategy in all the ways we think about city planning here in Toronto. Um, so with that, I'd like to start to introduce the speakers, uh, the panelists that we'll have uh, here uh, that I'll be moderating. Uh, we'll try to keep it right until 8 o'clock, which will give us a good half hour for questions. There's a lot of people here that I'm sure are uh, biting right to get to the point, uh, get their questions across to some of the speakers. Uh, and hopefully that will inform some of the ways in which we think about the strategy as we move it from draft to final product. So with that, I'd like to start to introduce the speakers, and I'll start quickly with Sandy, if that's okay. Hi. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sandy Smith is a professor in the Faculty of Forestry here at University of Toronto, and she's the former interim dean as well. Uh, she's an absolute leader in urban forestry and invasion here in Toronto, being involved in a number of NGOs, a number of uh, projects, many of which uh, you are a part of as well, be it LEAF, be it the Ontario Invasive Species Council. 
um, and her work has transcended Toronto to across the city uh, or across uh, the country as well. Uh, much of her work has been on the uh, Asian longhorn beetle and the emerald ash borer, some, some invasive species you may be familiar with. And of course, she's been a, 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 a keystone player in forestry here in Toronto with over 65 graduate students uh, who've passed through her lab and who've gone on to a number of uh, really interesting jobs through Canada and the world. So please, Sandy, come up and have a seat. Choose where you'd like to sit. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure, where the most water is. Uh, yeah, sure. So <laughs> next I'll bring up uh, another uh, University of Toronto faculty member. This is Dr. Mark Johnson. Uh, he's the Associate Professor at the University of Toronto Mississauga in Biology. He's also the Canada Research Chair in Urban Environmental Sciences, which is quite a unique position in Canada. And he's also the Director of the Centre for Urban Environments here in Toronto, uh, which has uh, got a really nice website and certainly a lot of really exciting projects to come. Uh, for me, what's been really exciting is some of his work on urban evolution ecology. And for those of you who are interested, there's a really nice set of papers that have come out of his lab in the last few years, and I'm sure he'll have a bit of time to talk about them tonight. So let's uh, welcome Mark Johnson. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, visiting us from uh, uh, outside of the country, we have Dr. Peter Del Uh He's currently a teacher in the Urban Planning Department at MIT, and he's formerly uh, from the, uh, he's a former director and research scientist at the Arnold Arboretum, uh, as well as the Landscape Architecture Department at Harvard, uh, where he's done quite, uh, you know, decades of, of really interesting and great work. One of my favorite bits has been his most recent book, The Wild uh, Urban Plants of the Northeast. Many of you have probably seen it if you've taken my class, and certainly uh, you may have it on your bookshelf. So let's uh, welcome Peter. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, of course, uh, we have uh, Dr. Deborah McGregor from, uh, she's cross-appointed at the Osgoode Hall uh, Law Faculty and the Faculty of Environmental Science at York University, where I did my PhD, great school. Um, she leads the Indigenous uh, Environmental Justice Project and has written extensively uh, on the topic of traditional environmental knowledge. Uh, she's also the former director of the Centre for Aboriginal Study, uh, Studies Initiatives and the Aboriginal Studies Program here at U of T, so welcome back. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. So uh, please have a seat, yes, and um, you know, in terms of the format, it's, uh, I'm going to be kind of posing some questions, maybe some follow-ups, uh, but I certainly encourage all of you to uh, speak to each question, but by no means you don't, don't feel the need to answer each. But the first question that I have, uh, that I'd like all of you to at least provide a one or two minute uh, reply to, something just to kick us off, is in a minute or two, can you tell us from you know, your own perspective what biodiversity means to you in your work? And maybe in that same uh, phrasing, if you could talk a little bit about how that perspective fits into practice in urban systems or urban environments. Uh, you guys have microphones, right? Oh, you do, on your heads. Uh, will anybody else? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes, you can. Why do you start, Sandy? Well, you have to repeat the question. I'm sorry, because I turned it on and it was doing, uh, ah. you know, this. Uh, this is live. Inter sorry, yeah. Are we recording this? <laughs> so let me repeat that question. So uh, to each of you, in a minute or two, could you please uh, tell us what biodiversity means from your perspective? And try to fit this into, uh, you know, how your perspective uh, fits within the practice of urban systems. OK, I can't, I'm on. You turn yours off. Um, so I guess in terms of biodiversity, it's um, all the uh, species. I'm an entomologist, so I always used to traditionally say, yeah, of course, it's that 75% of the world, the living uh, animal world that's out there. But of course, it's much more comprehensive than that, and it's the interactions between them. And so I think a biodiversity is more, more in a functional way, is a, a webs and networks um, that are in the world. And, how does it fit into urban? Well, the urban world is a, a very modified world. It's our construct. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not biodiversity here, but it means that perhaps it's, it's, it's got to be modified in some way. And um, that doesn't mean that we should really lower our standards, but we need to keep uh, nature and what is natural biodiversity as a reference. In forestry, we always talk about emulating nature, and I think that applies in cities. Mark? 
Right. So for me, it would be the diversity uh, in biology at all levels of organization. So this would be the traditional definition of the number of species and the relative abundance, but then also looking at higher levels of the evolutionary relatedness of those species, but then also within species, and I think this is something we've learned a lot more in the last 10 to 15 years, the diversity within those species, and particularly the genetic diversity. And so I'm interested, one of the things that my research addresses is how these completely novel ecosystems that we are creating, cities and urban environments generally, influence not just the ecological diversity, but also the diversity within species and how they're responding in, in surprisingly rapid and uh, in interesting ways. So. Well, just to build on that, um, one of the things that people um, oftentimes have our time believing is that when you, if you treat biodiversity as just a number of species, and I'm a, a plant guy, so you know I, I, I'm always thinking about the number of plants that cities, if you just look at the total number of species, are much more biodiverse. There are many more species in the urban environment than there are in the surrounding non-urban environment. This usually comes as a surprise to most people, but uh, cities by their nature have a lot of habitat biodiversity, and uh, that habitat biodiversity is reflected in the biodiversity of the species. And the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, biodiversity is a, is a tricky term to use in the context of, of uh, urban ecology because, you know, there's this uh, sort of dynamic uh, conflict between what's called good biodiversity or native species and then bad biodiversity, which is the non-native species. And so, you know, people use this one term. Uh, I like to use it to include both native and non-native species, but some people, when they use it, just refer to native species only. So I think that's a, it's, it's not, there's always a little bit of a, a sort of a little conflict when you bring up that term. Working now? Yep. Okay, good. I think it's working, yeah. Good. So, um, this is what happens if you invite me to the panel. <laughs> is, <laughs> first of all, we never saw the questions uh, ahead of time. Right. So, uh, I just came from teaching, like rushing down on the public transit from York uh, to get here. And we were just, uh, in my class, we were talking a lot about um, how do you decolonize processes? So when I read the strategy, well, how do I decolonize this thing? So, um, so I think when I think about biodiversity, I think that's, that's not... I'm trying to think like what that would mean, like say in my language, in Shabe language, there probably really isn't anything like that. It's sort of like a, a, a some term that's kind of imposed upon the territories that we are on for thousands of years that people are trying to do something with. Um, so what it kind of means to me, so the, the first compulsion I have is to kind of uh, challenge like the binary. So when I see biodiversity, um, especially in this strategy, there, I, I see an exclusion of people. And in an indigenous context, you wouldn't have that. Like it would, people would completely be part of this whole, uh, part of this whole process. So, so to me, I see a binary. My, that's the lens I see everything with. Like I just sort of like, hey, is there a binary there? Like is there a dual? So I kind of have this lens that I kind of look at everything through. So, I mean, I agree with everything. Like that is biodiversity, but then I think um, if you're putting a different lens on it from, you know, people who've been here for thousands of years, we would think about this um, uh, a little bit, um, a little bit differently. So I think um, disrupting that binary, and and I'm always looking for okay, where's the people in this, and what are their responsibilities? That's how I think about biodiversity from my point of view, and that's what happens when you invite me to these things, and I'm last. No, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. I, I completely agree that certainly we are part of biodiversity, and that is why perhaps it's so imperative that we are thinking about these things in cities where. The most of us were here, right, in, in cities. And so just to follow up on that, you know, one thing that uh, I didn't hear uh, within all of those different uh, definitions and certainly how they're integrated into the uh, kind of practice of urban planning and design is at what scale, right? So if, if any of you are speaking to a set of planners or practitioners or the city of Toronto, which is in the front row here, and we're talking about biodiversity at what scale, what what should we be focusing in on, or is there an optimal scale at which we're focusing on? And let me let me make uh, the point that you know I'm referring to citywide, or or does individual backyards matter in terms of perhaps how people are engaging or uh, placing themselves within biodiversity? What's what scale is important here, or are there skills that are not important? Do you want to start down that way? Sure, Deborah, do you? Oh, whoa, whoa! You got me by surprise. Um, because I, I mean, I like some of what Sandy talked about, like thinking about things as being in a web. So I wouldn't, um, 
I'd sort of resist that compulsion to want to priorize, or although scale is really important, I'm more into uh, what can you do at multiple scales, um, multiple approaches, multiple strategies, multiple tactics to try to approach the question. So I wouldn't exclude any of it. Like I wouldn't want people to think, oh, they're not part of this uh, initiative because we're going to focus on the city, however we're defining that. So I would say all of it's relevant. It depends on I guess how you approach it, and again, because I approach it from a responsibilities point of view. So of course the city has responsibilities, neighborhoods have a responsibility, community, and there's lots of different communities in Toronto. Individuals have a responsibility, schools. So I, that's kind of how I, I look at it. Like I tend to think about a whole bunch of things have to happen at once. Could be just the way my mind works. Uh, very hard to prioritize, don't it? Yeah. If you ask me to prioritize, uh, very challenging to do that. I'll just say, but there's interconnections with everything. Like how can you pick one over the other? So it'd be very, that's how I respond to that question. Well, um, what I would add is, you know, I, I'm, I, I was here in Toronto for the first time in June, and the, when um, my host, I have a, a, a nephew who lives here in Toronto, and I said, you know, I'm going to come up, I'm speaking at this conference, but you've got to take me to the Leslie Street Spit, okay? You know, I've got to visit the Leslie Street Spit because to make a pilgrimage because one of the things that it's actually a famous uh, piece of la landscape. Uh, I've been reading about it since the 1990s. And one of the things is that, you know, it's just a dumping of construction rubble in the lake for, you know, 30 or 40 years. And biodiversity happens. It happened there spontaneously. And one of the things about, you know, natural systems is if you leave them alone, they <laughs> essentially go through this process of succession and, you know, biodiversity happens over time. So there are things that we can do to promote biodiversity, and, uh, but there also nature uh, is, can do it itself. And I think it's this juxtaposition of these two forces that we have to, you know, there are areas where people have to sort of intervene to promote biodiversity, but there are also areas where we have to step back and let nature do whatever it is it wants to do, and we get another kind of biodiversity out of that. So biodiversity at what scale we're thinking about here. And, and, and I say for me, all of those scales are relevant from the smallest scale to the, the largest scale. And it often depends on the context. So as a, as a little boy growing up in Markham, for me, the level of biodiversity that I was excited about was underneath a rock and finding the different isopods and ants and, and snails and, and everything underneath there. That was what I was excited about. And then as I got older, it was trying to understand these communities, and then when I got a lot older, understanding the diversity across the entire world. And so I think understanding the connectedness and understanding that our city goes beyond, or maybe our, the governance of our city doesn't go beyond our borders, but our impact goes beyond those borders, and how we're impacted is larger than that. And thinking about the strategy, the biodiversity strategy, I think that's very important that we don't just think about where Toronto stops which is what I think the strategy currently does. It, there's a lot of strengths in there. But I think thinking in a larger scale from the local, but also how we fit into this larger landscape is really important if we want to do this, this seriously and if we want to do this right. Sandy, did, you any, did you have anything to add, Sandy? Or? I have to turn on. Um, OK, sorry. Yes, I, I mean, I was going to echo, I guess, what everyone said. Uh, my immediate response, and I'm sorry to bring this up again as a forester, is that I would be talking about scale. I would always be thinking scale. It includes all scales. I think, unlike Mark, though, I would start from the broad and come down. Um, because in forest planning, what you've got to be able to do is see how, what the big picture is, what are the big goals, what are we trying to head towards, and then figure out in a land use planning sort of prospect, um, perspective is how they all fit together. And so yes, backyards matter, individual trees and, and plants matter and what we do on that scale. And I think the biodiversity strategy, it tries to do that, but it, it, I, I would be looking for more of this linkage with the ravine strategy and some of these others. I, I see the reaching out, but of course, because it's a, a document within the city, the boundary somehow gets put there. But as a forester, I would want to see it in the context of southern Ontario and disturbed and converted landscapes that um, where we live, settled, as we call them. Right, I, I agree with, with all that as well. Again, that all scales certainly do matter, but what I do appreciate is, is the need to connect to individuals 
And those backyard gardens, you know, the, the neighborhoods, you know, uh, like uh, little things add to something bigger, right? And uh, certainly when we think about how we as individual gardeners, maybe homeowners, balcony owners here in Toronto, uh, what we do can influence one another, right? So, you know, uh, Mark sets up a beautiful primrose garden in his front yard, and the next year, maybe the next neighbor over has that, and so on and so forth. And they do. Yeah, he does actually have this. It's really quite nice. Yeah. You give him the plants, right? <laughs> no. No. Um, okay, so I, I can really talk here too. So I got to play moderator. Uh, these are topics that I'm super interested in as well. And uh, I want to keep this going though. Um, so I'm going to kind of flip the slides as I go and kind of thematically uh, uh, fitting into the questions that we're getting into. And yeah, have a look. Sorry, there's no green sp uh, screen at the bottom here, guys. It's a raccoon. <laughs> yeah, they're cute. Um, you know, there's lots of things that we don't do. There's lots of inaction in a city, right? In terms of, you know, directly uh, uh, thinking about biodiversity conservation at all scales. We just described there's many species that benefit uh, or even it can exploit uh, cities, right? Um, you know, I guess before I get into a bigger native, non-native debate and so on, if that comes up, certainly are there, you know, if we're thinking about biodiversity conservation, are there key species or key taxa that if focused on would benefit biodiversity writ large? Is there any, uh, uh, you know, we, again, we have the city of Toronto on the front row here. Are there any things we should be focusing in on? Please. Off and on, off and on. I don't want to interfere with your, your sound. Um, I guess from my end, and I'm referencing back to the biodiversity strategy um, and it, it already has tried to capture some of these more, I guess I would say charismatic species. Um, again, as an entomologist, I'm looking at bees and butterflies and going, and spiders even, which aren't insects. Yes, I know. But, um, <laughs> but that there's a whole bunch, uh, there's a whole, there's a large part of the invertebrate world. And so I guess those, be, those groups, uh, taxa, I think the city, the, the, the strategy calls them taxa, which I had some difficulty with that term because it didn't rest with me. But I guess at that level, they do represent something. And normally, I, I think, and if I speak for wildlife people, you think of large organisms that have large um, territories and, and landscapes that they need, that that would be the criteria to, to guide. But in a city, I'm not sure that's true, so I'll let my colleagues take it. Are there taxa that are, are more important than others to prioritize? Is that the question? You could phrase it that way, or another way perhaps is, are there taxa that if we did focus on, it would have a much greater impact on biodiversity writ large? So, for example, Sandy just mentioned right. insects. We all know birds yeah. eat insects and so on. I think there's often taxa that we like to focus in on, and those are often the charismatic species sometimes and often uh, the ones that are, that are rarest. But I think that that's not always necessarily the ones that have the biggest impact. Um, and so I think there has to be some caution in a, applying that approach. And you can think of some rare species that many of the species that are rare here in Canada are just at the very northern end of their range. And their northern range limit is moving north and moving south with climatic cycles, with, with human impacts. And we will not have a very large impact on those species and their persistence on this planet as a whole. But there are other species that are, that are really based in places of Canada, that this is a main part of their range, that if we impact their abundance, and, and it can have a, a really large impact and lasting impact on their persistence on this planet. And I think those are the types of species sometimes that we, that we forget about kind of the provenance of these different species. An but, example? Or? Um, we'll come back to that in a second because the, you know, barn swallow would be one example. So the barn swallow is one species that, that is in decline, in, especially in Canada, but it's actually one of the most common and widespread species in the world. You can find it on, I think, every inhabited continent. Um, yet we're very concerned about it here because the numbers have been going down locally. But I, I, I think it's really important to think of these as systems and not just pick on single species. And I'd say if, if I was to give some, some input on the, on the strategy, I don't see enough emphasis on integrated systems and communities and ecosystems and a lot more impact or focus on individual species. 
And sometimes those species are in those, those, those systems that you want to protect, those habitats, those communities. Um, but I think we have to, because it can be so difficult to identify which species are most important, understanding these ecological communities that are really quite unique to this area is a very important thing that uh, we should be prioritizing. Um, just to add to that, as a, you know, as a botanist, I, uh, you know, I tend to view, um, or I should say actually as a horticulturalist, uh, you know, everything uh, starts with the soil. And particularly in the urban environment, everything, all the garbage that we put into the environment, it either you know, goes into the lake or goes into the soil. And so the soil is where everything that we do in the environment it has to be processed. So really taking care of the soil and acknowledging the importance of the biodiversity of the soil, I think is really critical in the urban environment uh, for its capacity, not only to remediate some of these pollutants, but also to promote the growth of vegetation. You get the vegetation, then you get the animals, and you, you, but it all starts with the plant. It starts with the soil, goes to the soil organisms, goes to the plants, then it goes to the a animals. And, you know, that's something, if you're a backyard gardener, you know this, you know, if you don't put energy into that soil, you're not going to be able to grow anything. And I think if you can scale up that attitude to the urban environment, I think you, you, that's, that's the keystone of, uh, you know, every ecosystem that I've ever worked with. Everybody give anything to add to that? Or? I think, um, like, I agree with a lot has been said. And not that I don't have the perfect answer to that. I can only just relay um, some ideas that I've learned over time from different communities. So way back, I don't know, late 1990s, when they were developing the Species at Risk Act in Canada. Um, and part of my job with Chiefs of Ontario was to go out and talk to communities about species at risk and the, the endangered species and whatever. And that was a really difficult idea to get across to people, not that there were species that were disappearing, but then asking them which ones we needed to focus on, because they saw them as all interconnected, all related within an ecosystem. Why would you do that? Um, you have to focus on the whole system, because of course some, some, um, some animals have cultural significance as well. So if they weren't on the list, do we not care about them? So people had a lot of those kind of questions around. So I've always carried that with me that I wouldn't pick one over the other. Um, the other part of it, I guess, that, that I started to think about was um, how we don't really quite, we don't have the vocabulary to really talk about what our relationship to these species would be. Um, like in my field, I can't stand that vocabulary, like more than human, other than human, because I'm like, what does that mean? Anyway, so I know what it means, but it irritates me, because it's not, it's not a, an, an indigenous perspective. So people like Robin Kimmerer, who's a plant scientist, or Kyle White, would talk about them as being relatives and kin, like they're species that we learn from. So I don't know why we would like it would be illogical from our point of view to pick some over the other to focus on because we're going to learn from all of them as a relative and as a teacher. So to us, that's a better word to use than species um, because they're actually, you're, they're actually seen as um, entities that you would actually learn from and have responsibilities and that would also be um, reciprocal. So that's how people understood it. Um, and I've always carried that with me as being how I would look at these kind of um, look at these kind of issues and questions. No, I love that. It's like a very non-specious perspective, right? Like all uh, sure. Another label, no labels. Right? <laughs> no, but you know, certainly we often will focus on species at risk or those that yeah. are in great peril. Uh, uh, that is, at the same token, we're also looking at those that are contributing functionally to our environment. For example, bees or bats and trying to think about, well, what's their functional role and maybe we should be prioritizing those species. And so that, that, that kind of emerged, but it does fall into the kind well, of... I think another part oh, of it, it was just is... Like when people are relating to animals like as part of their clan, that's also people well-being, not just the ecosystem well-being. I think that was the other point that I was trying to get across. What isn't just, it isn't, again, it's that separation that I'm trying to like bring back together again in this conversation. So, when, so it's like the well-being of the ecosystem and the different species and how they relate to one another because they also have relationships with each other, but also people's well-being and relationship uh, to those teachers and relatives or um, species. Sorry to interrupt, but I was just going, no, that wasn't quite it. But Please, yeah. all of you interrupt me. As oh, much as you really? Wish. Yeah, don't tell your students that. But <laughs> with the functional perspective, though, and thinking about that, 
we still are in the infancy of understanding the functions of different species and how they fit into communities and, and ecosystems. And we know that bats are taking out insects, but it was only five, ten years ago that we really started to come to grips with the role that soil microbes play. And this field is still just taking off. We know almost nothing other than it's really important. Right. Whenever we look at it, it's really important. We don't know which species, we don't know when, we don't know why. And so I think that's the danger of picking one species as opposed to this is an important ecosystem. We don't know all the reasons why it's important, but we know it has a unique collection of species that are doing something that's pretty different on the landscape. That's a, that's a really good point. And you know, that brings me to my next point in, in thinking about that unique collection of species that we find in cities, you know, in an era of great, great globalization and the access to non-indigenous plants uh, from horticultural society, uh, entities and so on, industry. You know, we know that native plants can uh, uh, certainly support a variety of native wildlife. You know, there's lots of good examples from oaks and so on. Um, it, this is maybe an interesting question. Uh, should cities take uh, you know, a native first or a native only approach when they're thinking about practice? So everywhere from parks to, uh, to green roofs to how they engage with the citizens of Toronto. Uh, and, and what's the consequences of not considering what some might argue, maybe Peter might argue, the, this, the best species for the job or, or, or the, 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 the condition, right? So perhaps a, a non-native species that may be better in an era of a changing climate or certainly compaction, pollution, and so on. Now, the image I have here is, oh, yes, uh, that's this the wrong one, no. Uh, this is the one I want to go to. And this is one of our favorite uh, uh, non-native species to Toronto. It's one that certainly uh, has its range limit that's not so far away from where we are now. But as you can see, it's supporting a native uh, uh, carpenter bee here and certainly a myriad of other species in the spring. Now, uh, one, uh, uh, you know, uh, someone who may be focused on native species only may choose not to plant this. But uh, I was just interested in all of your perspectives on whether we should be taking a native only approach. Sh should I start with that? Please. I'll start, okay, I'll start with that and then you guys can uh, shoot me down. Uh, you did bait me. Um, I think the thing is, is I read actually the, uh, the biodiversity strategy twice, you know, um, once at home before I left it and once on the airplane coming here. And um, I think that, you know, what's interesting is it, it clearly, uh, the way it's written, it favors, it prioritizes native species. It acknowledges the existence of non-native species, but at a, a sort of a, a lower level. And the way I f see this issue is that I'm all in favor of preserving native habitats and the native species they contain. But I think in an urban context, you also have to acknowledge the existence of what are called novel ecosystems that are composed of, and I don't like this term native and non-native at all. I think it's, it's counterproductive. I prefer the term cosmopolitan. So I like to refer to cosmopolitan vegetation in the cities. And that, you know, these novel ecosystems are composed of, you know, some combination of uh, native and non-native species. And these, you know, and it's in areas where the soil has been radically disturbed so that you can't really restore the native ecosystem because you no longer have a native soil. And we need to actually focus on these uh, ecosystems as well. How do we increase their ecological functionality, their aesthetic uh, quality, so that they can actually contribute to making cities more livable? And I think you have to do both of them simultaneously with equal vigor and enthusiasm. It's not an either-or question. That's the way I see it. Please. I heard that. Did I turn it off? Oh, I agree with Peter, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah, why I had to jump in next. Um, you know, it's not an either or. I agree with that. And I, I have always difficulty with native and non-native. I don't like drawing lines. Um, but I think the way the question was phrased, uh, Scott, was uh, would you put native species first? And I would say yes, of course I would. Um, but recognizing that there's um, uh, intersections, that there's changes that happen, that the, the world and ecosystems are dynamic, and that humans are part of this, and certainly cities are built environments of our construct, no different than Sorry, I'm going to simplify this to large termite mounds. Uh, there's lots of social insects, like uh, social primates, that create places to live that other organisms live in them. 
So I guess, I, again, it's maybe sort of saying we're different, and I don't like to think that we're different. Um, and I think the other comment I would make, when I hear cosmopolitan species, that, <laughs> that bothers me, and I'm, I'll keep thinking about why it bothers me, but I think it bothers me, first of all, because it's, a, it's kind of a human term. It, it makes it sound like, yeah, it's good to be cosmopolitan, right? <laughs> that we go to Paris and then we go to. I'm, I'm rebranding the invasives. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm just going that. You know, that's a human thing again. And so, the more things move around, I don't know if that's a good thing. I, I, I don't think we have the evidence. I don't think we have the track record. I don't think we really know what we're doing. So, as an ecologist, I would just sit there and I. I'd like to reach back to Aldo Leopold and ethics, uh, green ethics of, or green uh, fire of land ethics, and sort of say, err on the side of caution. Like, yeah, let's put them first. There are lots of species that can fit into cities that are native. Um, almost any environment in a city, there's probably, you know, heavy salt, there's, there's species. I live in this insect world, there's lots of species that live in, in high uh, concentrations of salt. A rock, rock faces, which are what our skyscrapers are, uh, drought, you know, let's go there first. I also struggle with the, the value judgment put to native versus non-native. And if we equate um, non-native or, or invasive as, as a bad thing, then we should immediately get rid of all honeybees from from, and you know, you may agree with that, <laughs> but simply the moderator. I think you know half the audience may not be happy with that because they like their honey and they don't want to ship it in from Europe or, or wherever. Uh, they can, and it's, it's important to recognize that there are a number of contexts where non-native species can play important ecological and ecosystem level roles. There's no question that honeybees can have some negative effects on native bees, but they can also have a lot of positive effects on many plant species. Certainly. And similarly, you know, the plant that I study a lot right now is, is the very humble but beautiful white clover that is the bane of many people's existence that have a lawn here. But it turns out that when it's been quantified that in urban environments, in most grasslands, white clover provides two-thirds of all nectar to bees. That's an invasive species to our city, and it's playing a hugely important ecosystem role on your lawns. And so don't try to get rid of it. And sometimes invasive species can have very positive ecosystem roles for native species and communities. Any other last oh, all righty. Yes. So, well, I, it, it's an interesting question, again, because I still work in species at risk, aquatic invasive species for some of the work I do on the Great Lakes and Canada-Ontario Agreement. And, um, and clearly, um, most First Nation communities anyway are interested in the native species, um, or indigenous, which always feels weird to me because I say yeah, I'm right. native. But anyway, so um, for all kinds of reasons, like for supporting culture and traditions and identity. And, but at the same time, people, um, but we also have ultimately a responsibility to support all life. So people think about, okay, what would be the role then within this larger world that we have of, um, of other species? Um, and so, so that's actually something that people are thinking about. How do, how do we make that accommodation? Someone like, um, because this is what we would be facing with um, climate change, there's going to be other species coming into places that we live and, and using our own tradition and ontology, the way that we see the world and how we want to relate to life is he says, okay, maybe we need to renew relationships. We need to, we need to develop those new kind of relationships with these other kind of um, these are the kind of beings or teachers or, or species that are going to be coming into the places um, that we live. So I wouldn't say it's ruled out, but definitely people are like, you know, um, in order to, because of, well, basically because of colonization, people want to, big part of it for well communities is to reconnect with those <laughs> species that we had connections to that supported our life and well-being uh, and identity for thousands of years. So that's... That's in the work that I do, that's what I see. And people are thinking about, struggling with, debating, what do we do about, what do we think about these other species in line with our you know, overriding philosophy to support life. So that's kind of, those are some of the conversations that people are having in the work that I do. Can I ask you a question? So in the context of, of, of this, 
So how would something like corn or, or tobacco, which, which wasn't originally from these areas, but was brought in um, and farmed here, how would it be viewed kind of in this context? Uh, well, we always traded. So right. trading, so especially this area, so right. Mexico, so that wasn't unusual um, to travel and to reconnect with other nations. So a big part of our indigenous knowledge systems is also connecting with other nations and their knowledge systems. So that wasn't unusual to us at all. So right. encountering Western knowledge and Europeans wasn't unusual. Like we were already connecting with other nations and, and sharing knowledge. Um, you would send people to go live in other communities to learn the language and learn those ways and bring that knowledge back. So that's not unusual for us to have to, um, to do that. So communities in the north would then travel here. There's areas, Toronto's one of them, uh, Winnipeg's another one, where people did trade, where you weren't gonna grow it or it wasn't really your culture, let's say, and then you would trade and connect right. um, in that way. So you could access it. Right. And just a quick comment on the red bud. If you look actually at the paleo record, it was here in Ontario um, a number of tens of thousands of years ago. So it's native. <laughs> well, it just went locally. Just the moderator. <laughs> 10,000 years ago. And of course, I'm a huge uh, promoter and supporter of this beautiful tree. It's in flower in the spring. Um, <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's keep this going. This is quite good. And, and you know, just touching on the idea of the cosmopolitan species, maybe we might rebrand white clover as a cosmopolitan species. It does quite well here. It's important. Uh, you know, spontaneous uh, species, but perhaps it's maybe not so invasive, right? It's quite a, a, a term that's used uh, uh, to, to delineate species that, you know, displace native species and have some uh, undermining impact either environmentally or socially or economically. And certainly uh, we're in an era of, of great environmental change and globalization and the movement of plants and animals has led to uh, this fairly large threat of invasive uh, 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 biological invasions, which can have uh, quite negative impacts. Uh, one of the species that we study uh, is this one here. And uh, this is what we call the dog strangling vine. And this is out at the Rouge National Park, Canada's first urban national park, which is, some might argue, being decimated by this uh, really uh, pervasive plant that uh, leads to great monocultures in the understory and in the meadows. So, uh, you know, I would argue, why are we not all out right now pulling this plant out of the ground? We've got a big group here, um, but very, by and large, it's quite difficult to engage society in that way, and certainly the city itself is operating in many silos, many different departments that may not be able to communicate the, the impending threat and potential doom of species like this. How do ecologists engage with planners to deal with the threat of invasive species in cities? Any thoughts? I feel like this is a question for you, Scott. Thank you. Moderator. <laughs> you can go ahead. I will not go first. Reword, <laughs> please. Oh, I, I mean, it, you know, it, it, you know, I've, I've taken, a, you know, a, a, a unpopular position on this. I think that the, you know, one of the, the things about this, it comes back to this idea of native versus non-native, and that that dichotomy, when we de start dividing the world into native and non-native, that, that creates um, these divisions. And given the globalization that's occurred, given climate change, the world is not the way it was three or 400 years ago. It's a very different place. And no organisms are native to the city, okay? <laughs> this, you know, they're, they're native to what used to be here before there was a city, but no organisms are native to the city. So this whole idea that we're gonna bring native vegetation back to the city, to my way of thinking, it's, it's a nice idea, but uh, realistically speaking, it, it doesn't have any basis. It it's really it has to do with his history. And you know, the world is changing whether we like it or not. And so I think that, you know, and, and I'll say it, that I have spent a large portion of my life working with native species, and it's not that I don't think that they're important and we ought to focus on them, but I think the key element here is when we are trying to conserve native biodiversity, we have to be very careful in picking our battles, and we want to pick sites where we've got a really good chance of restoring that site, and within the urban context, there's lots of areas that are just gone too far. They're, they're beyond any concept of restoration, and those areas, those are, we're getting good value out of them. We're 
we're not actually putting a lot of money into them. We're getting ecological services out of them. And so the whole idea of, you know, pitting natives versus non-natives as this, you know, as these opposites, I think in, in today's world, it's not all that helpful because it doesn't actually explain what's happening. So this is where I strongly want to disagree. No, no, that's right. Yeah, but, I, you know, it's a discussion. That's good. Right. In that... I do think you're right, and we have to pick our battles. And although I was trying to come to the defense of non-natives for a second because I love <laughs> white clovers, there's, there's, there's context where I do think it's really important to, to fight that battle when you have something like the dog strangling vine or the European buckthorn or uh, garlic mustard. And we can go down that list of, of species that end up being this freight train that just rolls over everything and, and completely decimates diversity, especially in our forests, like this dog strangling vine. And there's two reasons why I think this is really important. And this gets back to the scale issue that you, Matt, brought up earlier. One, I think sometimes when we're, we're making these strategies, we're thinking too locally. We're not thinking about the impact that we're having outside of the border of Toronto, outside in Ontario, outside the rest of, of this, this, uh, this country, and the, the entire continent. You know, if you ask Sandy about the invasive species that have rolled through Ontario, many of them started on the East Coast in his city of Boston. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm not blaming you. <laughs> You're, wel You're welcome. It's, it's, I'll right? take full responsibility. We, have, we take responsibility for some of them, but we need to think about a larger context in that case. And similarly, something like garlic mustard or dog strangling vine, realizing that it's not just contained in the city. We may have lost a certain area, right. but it's going out into other areas that still have not been that strongly affected with this. And the other point is, I want my kids to grow up with an area where they can actually experience more biodiversity, where they're going to see the non-native diversity, but I also want to be able to show them the, the native diversity. And we've just started a junior naturalist program out in Mississauga for kids grades 3 to 12, or sorry, grades 3 to 8, and I don't want the only thing that they're looking at is that, right? And so if we can take some of that out and get some trilliums in and get some, some other native species in, yeah, I would like that. Sandy, please. Sorry. Um, I'm going right. to I'm gonna come to Peter's defense. No. <laughs> I um, love this. <laughs> uh, because I do think you have to strategize. And while I may agree with Mark that we want to have as much of this diversity as we need. I think when you deal with problems like this, and there's been multiples of them, this isn't the first and it won't be the last that looks like this, um, I, that I think you have to pick and choose your battles. I, I, that's right, I agree, because you asked the comments, and this is where I want it sort of reworded, is thinking about what does an ecologist say to a planner? And you've got to be careful uh, you know, that you don't, you won't have so much money, time, energy to get into this. And I've gone through this with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council or, and the Invasive Species Centre and these decisions that one makes, whether it's in my backyard or it's at the larger scale that, um, that marks, you know, sort of looking beyond our boundaries, I, you, you can't get, you can't change them all. I think they're here to stay. Let's hope that they don't continue to look like this, that things will change over time. That's right, climate change and invasive species. We're moving species around. The one thing I know as an ecologist that things change and that they're connected. I guess that's the classic. Um, but I, I think um, this problem, you have to tackle, tackle it in different ways from the local community to the kids. We're going to learn about how to go out. Pulling it doesn't necessarily help, but it oh. educates people. It may not get rid of that, but it gets people aware of what is and mm. isn't invasive. And so I think that's really important. And you, you, you can't, uh, there's so many of these now that it's really hard to, you know, solve each one individually. And I guess the last point I wanted to make is, I keep repeating this as an entomologist. I don't know where that comes from, um, is that, I, my definition of invasive has been, I think, a little bit different than many people because I don't see them only as alien or introduced. Um, we have mountain pine beetle, we have uh, spruce budworms, uh, we have forest tent caterpillars, um, hemlock or canker worms. Uh, you know, they can look like this for a couple of years. They can decimate forests as they have in BC and Alberta with mountain pine beetle and in the East Coast. 
last cycle 40 years ago. So they are invasive, yet they're native. So native and non-native doesn't, in my mind, overlap with invasive. Um, this is the way nature works. Sometimes there's these huge populations. I think it comes back to us working in cities is, are we going to allow this? Like, how do we want to work with it? And back to the planners, I think we have to be strategic. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't, can't give an ecologist perspective, but I do do planning. So what I would say to planners is um, that to connect people, like don't make the decision for people, like connect with people and find out what, they, um, what they're able to do and what kind of responsibilities they're willing to assume. I'd also say connect to um, a lot of the ongoing initiatives that are already going on, like Doug Anderson restoring the Great Lake, or sorry, the um, Humber. So in, uh, connecting with indigenous peoples who are engaging in restoration work so that because um, they can tap into knowledge base, because there's a lot we don't know, we don't know. Um, and that they can tap, you know, tap into people who do an a lot more, people who carry that knowledge that was here for um, a really long time and have had to adjust to major environmental change. That's what we've had to do as Indigenous people, like we know how to do that really well or we wouldn't be here. So, um, so that's what I would say, that, that's the advice I would give to planners. Because uh, when I plan, I don't make the decision for people, you try to empower people to kind of make the best decisions that they can and to be responsible for those kind of decisions. Can I follow, please, I want to follow please. up on that because I think that's a really important point. And, you know, getting back to this uh, plant here, this, uh, we call this black swallow wart. Um, but it is, you know, this is a very hard plant to kill. And in fact, I, in my experience, only you can pull it all you want and it's going to come back. Herbicides yes. work. Yes. And this is what, uh, People, when are confronted with that choice, and you tell people you're going to spray this, people really don't like that. The herbicides are not something people have readily embraced the way they might have in the 60s or 70s. And so, you know, once you involve the people in this decision, the only tool that's available for controlling that plant is really pretty much off the table uh, if, you, if you're going to consult the people that actually live in that area. And so this, then you be, you're weighing, you know, the, 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 the cause and the effect. I mean, what's really interesting to me is somebody who's spent a long time, you know, looking at the history of herbicides, you know, in the, when herbicides, uh, the 2,4-D, uh, before Roundup was invented, you know, they, they didn't have a market for it. You know, it was originally invented to use in uh, during the war to defoliate uh, plants and stuff like that. And the war ended and they didn't have anything. So they, they figured, well, let's, uh, we got to come up with a way to use this great invention. And they essentially declared white clover, your favorite plant, a weed, you know, in the lawns. And we have now the solution to get rid of it. We're going to use 2,4-D. And starting in the 1950s, all these chemicals just were just sprayed all over everything in order to essentially promote the perfect lawn. And we've now sort of rejected that, but what's interesting is that, you know, in the, the mantle of controlling invasive species, herbicides have now come back in a big way because it's really the only way to control a lot of these. So we now have to make a choice, you know, which is it that we want to do? Do we want to control these invasive species using these herbicides or, you know, uh, maybe just leaving them alone in certain circumstances is Okay, and I'm not advocating for one of those positions, but this is where the planning comes in. This is what planners have to then navigate that decision. The biologists can sort of lay out the options, but I think the planners then have to step in. I don't know if you want to react to that, but I, I want to react, but I'm cognizant <laughs> You're not of our going time to. and have any questions, so we'll, I'll react later. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got a reaction there too, uh, but. To that point, you know, one thing, common theme that's coming through here, of course, is that people are part of biodiversity, right? It's not biodiversity over here and we're here. We're, we're part of this, part of nature, right? And one thing I did notice, uh, or do notice sometimes uh, going about the city uh, in some of my research, uh, I haven't switched a slide yet, it's going to come, uh, <laughs> is, is that uh, sometimes we restrict access to areas in the city, for example, in Glendon College or uh, through at the Don Valley, where we're trying to do active restoration. Uh, of, of native uh, landscapes in some of these uh, charismatic and certainly critically important areas of our city. And just going off what you mentioned earlier, Mark, you know, what, what, is it, what are these places going to look like for kids of the future? Well, what about now? You know, um, you know, given the incredible diversity we have in the city, the number of experiences, language, cultural norms, etc., you know, how do we ensure that uh, all Torontonians have equal access to nature and opportunities to experience with a biodiverse landscape? 
you know, uh, do we restrict areas in the city, you know, for, given that we have such lack of green space, do we, do we proceed with setting aside areas where people can't go so that we can restore native vegetation and the biodiversity that we uh, uh, ascribe to that? Is that a strategy that's uh, worthwhile? Um, anyone? I'll start off Please, on yeah. this one in that there are some contexts when I think you really do have to do that and you have to do that because it's the law in certain contexts. So piping plovers have started to nest <laughs> on shorelines nearby and if we just let people go wherever they want, um, you know, they will not be coming back from the brink of extinction. And that's a, that, I think that's something that really no one wants. And so we res whenever we find a nesting pair on a beach, no one's allowed down that beach other than people that are carefully right. monitoring those populations. So there are lots of contexts where I think we do have to do that. And because we do want native biodiversity, I think that um, there are certain contexts where we should restore certain areas and maybe we open them up again. You know, if it's being heavily impacted, and there was an example in the report that you know, was heavily right. impacted by, by cyclists and and you know, it's being brought back to a, a more native state. Um, in terms of engaging these, uh, the youth, I think it's really important. And I, I, I say that's another thing I'd like to see more in this the strategy is about engagement and particularly engagement of the youth. And that if we're really going to change the way we do things, I think it's not convincing us <laughs> or convincing people in this room, really. Uh, Many of us created the problem that we have right now, but really I think we have to educate the next generation, these young kids, to think differently, to value the biodiversity that's around us, appreciating it so that they, they recognize the value of, of preserving it and protecting it. Any other thoughts? Yes. <laughs> it's, the simple answer, yes, and I was going to say, uh, it probably links with, with what Deborah may or may not say, but again, ask the people, like get them engaged, and I think it's referencing what you're talking about is the next generation, but just getting people engaged, and they'll want to save it. You'll be able to bring it back. The city has many good examples of this, of uh, you know, in High Park and some of the areas that were fenced off, and if you can keep deer out of certain sites, you can do a lot better on the understory veg. So um, I think, uh, yeah, yes. I think that um, it, it definitely has its purpose. And you, I mean, I'm, I mean, you give the Glendon example. And the only thing is really getting people to kind of respect it. I mean, I was there recently. People, the people, it's clearly saying trying to restore this area, big fence, and people's dogs are running amok, even oh, though it says right. keep yeah. the dog on a leash, don't do this. I'm like, wow, man. But then, so that's one issue. So I think when you're trying to, because essentially what you're doing is you're trying to manage people's behavior in order to <laughs> restore the species. So you have to figure out how you're going to manage people's behavior if they don't kind of get it. Um, but I think the, but I think when you, when, when you were talking about access, I started thinking about it more from a social justice perspective around the city, like certain people have access to those sites and right. not others. And so I think that's an important consideration as well. And where do you start and how do you address that? So that, um, so again, focusing on, on younger people and youth, and they tend to be in schools most of the time from five, whatever, four to 17, hopefully. Um, so I think that's Im important as well, so is, is addressing also the social aspect, who actually has access to this. Uh, where my husband's a teacher, I would, most of the kids there would not have access to that Glendon site. I just, right. that's where I go to the gym, so that's why I'm familiar with it, but I have the privilege of being able to do that through working at York, right? So I think there's that element that also has to be considered, who actually has um, access. And then you're trying to manage people who can't manage themselves, and that's what you end up having to do is put a fence up and say, stay away, because we're trying to achieve some sort of broader collective, um, broader collective goal. Right. It's disconcerting to see it, but then you get why, right? It's not a hard concept. Yeah. Well, I'm going to re react to a different question rather than one you asked, but I think that this question of how, how you. you get kids involved in nature, uh, and I've spent a lot of time my time teaching, and one of the things that I think is really important, and it gets to the point you were making earlier, which is having a relationship with plants. Now, a lot of people laugh when I talk about having a relationship with plants, but it's real, it happens. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, myself serially monogamous in my relationship <laughs> with plants. Uh, you know, I've studied this one tree for like 30 years, but nevertheless, um, 
And I think you do this through gardening and horticulture. And I think that that's, if I had to make one criticism of the report, I think that it's not just about conserving natural areas and a lot of the land that is sort of marginal in terms of conservation purposes has value in terms of gardening and cultivation. And when you cultivate a plant, you have to have a relate, you develop a relationship with it. And once you learn how to have a relationship with plants, that then can broaden to beginning to have a relationship with nature. But if you just have a, try to have a relationship with nature as an abstraction, I think kids don't understand that. They understand food, you know, they understand flowers, they understand the very tangible things. So I think that integrating some horticulture, if you really want to get kids, bring kids into this thing, it's more than just appreciating biodiversity. I mean, kids do not understand the concept of biodiversity. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, you know, they understand. They understand the concept of having a relationship with a yes, plant. Yes, absolutely. Because like, we I haven't educated that kind of creativity and innovation out of it. We do that later. But when they're little, they can do that. So I think you build on what mm -hmm. they're already really good at. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good point, and almost like an appreciation of nature acting as almost like an invisible barrier to uh, you know uh, harassing a plover as it nests. You know, rather than there being a fence put around, an appreciation of nature could act. Uh, in much the same way, but in, a, in an invisible, permeable way. Anyway, just a thought. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, uh, flip uh, slightly uh, and go a bit uh, vertical, uh, so to speak. This is uh, the Green Roof Innovation Testing Lab at our old Daniels faculty building at 230 <coughs> Um, you know, cities are growing uh, all over North America and all over the world, right? But at the same time, there's cities that are shrinking, right? Cities that maybe are not certainly not shrinking in terms of their impervious service, but certainly their population density. And Toronto is the opposite of that, of course. Toronto's growing immensely. Um, and where people experience nature and that type of nature is changing, right? So how people may experience biodiversity, if I'm a child growing up in a condo, I don't get home from school and go into my backyard. I, Maybe I go onto a rooftop to experience nature or some other odd way that we may not have envisioned uh, several decades in the past. And so as green infrastructure becomes more common in a city like Toronto, we, we recently surveyed all the green roofs in Toronto. We've got over 650 of them built now. And certainly many bioswales and many other forms of green infrastructure that we can think of. Um, many of these are implemented to support different ecosystem services that industry and so on really like. But one real opportunity, perhaps, is how, uh, these engineered systems providing biodiversity habitat. In an era of these novel ecosystems, uh, uh, can these engineered systems support biodiversity in a city like Toronto? Go ahead. <laughs> I have some opinions about this, sure. <laughs> So the, the simple answer is yes, but I think it's much more general. And I was asked by, by a couple of the uh, people from the city, you know, how do we mobilize some of these things? And I think the biggest thing is engagement with the public at all levels. You know, we've talked about starting young, and I think that's the key to long-term sustainability here. Mm. But at each age group, trying to engage people about the small actions they can take but the big consequences they can, that can have when everyone starts to, to implement some of these, these changes. So you can imagine, we have 2.9 million people in this city, I think is the approximate number. Imagine if everyone had their own little horticultural garden plot with a selection of their favorite native species and a selection of their favorite other flowering species. Imagine that all across the city. What an impact that would have. Yeah, on diversity of, of plants, the diversity of insects, the diversity of birds, the, you know, this would cascade from bottom up, the bacteria to the plants and, and beyond. And wow, we could really have a massive impact if everyone did a little bit in their patch, whether it's on their roof, on their balcony, or in their front and backyards. I think the, the small, impact of each person contributing a little bit could be really massive and that would really put us on the map internationally. No I, I was just going to say, um, I mean, I guess, yes, again, the simple answer is yes. Uh, the more you can create these living spaces uh, for other than people, but where we engage with them and learn from them, obviously very positive. I, I think what I 
as Mark was talking about it, I, I think the other piece for me, having worked with communities, with uh, urban trees and tree inventories and developing urban forest management plans for almost two decades now, maybe a bit more, is that community engagement is important and people, but that place is really important um, in that they have to connect with that. So a garden for one year, I, I happen to live close here and there's lots of student turnover and I notice, and, and maybe I would just say that's more um, absentee landlords, but when you live in a place and stay in a place, you, you want to learn from the place and you want to teach your children. But if you're constantly moving, then you don't really care. You, you don't tend it as well, or you don't, you don't form a relationship with it as long as I think is needed. And I guess that, I'm not sure what that comment is other than we move around a lot. Well, that's called the, I call and that I, the, the renter's mentality. Uh, well, it's the cosmopolitan <laughs> thing. I mean, they come coming back that, you know, if we're cosmopolitan, then we don't stay in one place and we never really learn. We just kind of move around. And uh, that's probably the wrong definition, <laughs> Peter, for your cosmopolitan. But anyway, I, I just think that it does require being in a place to, to get that sense of soil and land mm -hmm. and relationship. It does. Sorry. On green roofs, soil is called substrate. A substrate, yeah. Well, I just, I'm all in, in favor of this. I mean, I, I looked at that uh, Darwin's Hill right out here, this little <laughs> thing. I mean, you know, I know there was a big fancy plan for that. But You're what it, Well, what it, has, what it is is totally not what it was intended to be. It's become something totally different. It's this wild experiment that somebody did out there. But the biodiversity that it is supporting and will continue to support in the future is kind of amazing. We don't know how it's going to end up. You know, but I think experiments like this are terrific. You know, I don't see any downside from them. I mean, the top of a building is a, you know, it's, it's under, there's, you know, it's just a blank slate. So if you can figure out and you've got the resources to do something with it, that's terrific. But Peter, what if that, that gets invaded by dog strangling vines? Well, like, it's already been invaded. I looked at the weeds that are growing <laughs> out and there and over. nobody, they weren't planted by anybody. They came in with the soil yes. that was used to essentially the build that hill. That was the the soil was not it sterilized. Was yes, it, was it was not was, sterilized. Does <laughs> everybody give anything out there? Yeah. I think I would just build on what uh, Sandy said, which is, if, if the ultimate purpose of the, the strategy is, like I, I was reading it through and I was trying to like pick out the language. Is it stewardship? Is it caretaking? Um, is it relationships? I didn't actually see a lot, a lot of that, but I think it's kind of implied in a lot of places. So it depends on what the ultimate purpose is. So when I think about this, I'm like kind of neutral about it because really what it would be trying to do is if you're trying to teach people how to relate, um, and for me, more importantly, take responsibility. If, if you're maintaining that and that's your purpose, then sure. But if it's not, if you're excluding people and only certain people can access right. it, and then I have then I have trouble with that because it, it becomes if it bec like when you say engineered, I'm thinking, oh, I don't really see a lot of people in engineering. Like, how are kids going to access the rooftop? So I think it depends on what the ultimate purpose is. So if the purpose is stewardship, caretaking, um, I always like to add responsibility in as part of that. So. Um, so to me, again, it would depend on what the purpose of it is, and is it is it helping with that purpose, or is it going to alienate people from that purpose? So these can do either of them, but it, so they can be very helpful, or they can just like I just go, huh? Right, whatever. like a, you know, yeah. a green roof on top of a new building is never a replacement for accessible ground level habitat. That that building has gone into place, right? Um, well, it could if people develop a relationship with it and learn how to care and be right. responsible. Like, it depends on the values that you're trying to teach people. Mm. But certainly with so many of them being constructed in the city, they really do provide an opportunity for what we heard, the designed experiment, you know? By collaborating as scientists with practitioners and with planners and so on, we can really uh, think of ways in which we may learn and improve upon some of these designs through time. So it's, I find that really exciting. And we are really cutting it close, but it's perfect because I have one question left. Um, and, you know, here's Toronto. Um, and, uh, you know, we are here meeting to talk a bit about a biodiversity strategy. The city has uh, decided that this is an important aspect that we need to be considering at uh, all levels of Im implementation in the city. What is the target? You know, what is the end goal? What, how do we know we were successful? 
in implementing this. Not, not necessarily getting into what that strategy necessarily is, but you know, is it avoiding a threshold of no return? Or, or is there something bigger here that we need to aspire to? And basically, when do we know we've done a good job? <laughs> well, that, I was going to say, that was going to be maybe one of my biggest criticisms, because the word success is used. Uh, a lot, and, and I'm in a, I have worked a little bit in the policy world. Like, we do want to be positive about success, but how do you measure it? Like, what's the evidence? I think I, when I went through the documents, kind of going, yeah, that sounds good, but what are we measuring to be able to know? Like, how will we know? Even if we have an idea what the goal and the vision is, and I would wonder sometimes if we're really sure about that in terms of restoration. But, but more importantly, how do we measure it and how do we know we go forward? Because that's the only way, I mean, maybe success isn't such an important goal, but to know what the trajectory is so that you know you're maybe going off what you re where you think you want to go. Because I think where people think they want to go may change. It, it's, it, it depends what people want if we come back to people. So, I think it's important to bring in the, the, the evidence, the measurements, the monitoring. I mean, that's what, in my world, is the only way to measure. <laughs> Thanks. Any final thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I, I would just, I'm not a resident of Toronto, so I, you know, the way I see all of this, you know, this uh, biodiversity plan is, is to make the city more livable for not only you know the plants and the animals, but also for the people that live here as well. And I think that uh, you know that's a really um, uh, you know that, that it's really important that you know it's not just about conserving plants and animals. It's also making Toronto a you know a greener more habitable city for all of its, and everybody lives here. And with climate change, with increasing temperatures, increasing drought and everything like that, uh, that's one of the things you really have to look at. Temperature is like an obvious thing you want to measure in, in cities is, you know, and vegetation can have an impact on temperature, the shade that trees create. So, I mean, I think you have to look at it two ways, the biological and then as well as the, you know, what does it mean for the human inhabitants as well? Please. Okay, I think the way that I'll answer that, I was probably on the subway when the land acknowledgement was given, but I think I always go back to that um, because it's an acknowledgement of the people who were caretakers and responsible so that we could be here, those ancestors, um, and that, um, that we have these obligations um, to, to the land, as in all the beings and ecosystem and entities and bio, whatever, whatever words we want to use for its species. Um, so I think ultimately the 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 scaled question would be are we good ancestors because um, we're descendants are we good ancestors to those future generations those children so that um, that we're sustaining life for them whatever that life is whether however we understand species or biodiversity whatever new relatives or teachers might come in that we develop a relationship with but are we good ancestors um, and will our descendants look at us and know that we are good ancestors so that's sort of so that's what I tell people when we talk about the land acknowledgement. Are you a good ancestor? How do you know you're being a good ancestor? What are we sustaining for um, future generations? And are we making those kind of um, decisions? Like every decision is a seventh generation decision. That's what you're thinking about. So that's how I think about it. Final words, Mark? One thing is clear. We're never going to make it like it was, right? It's nev this is never going to be completely treed um, unless there's a major catastrophe. <laughs> This is not going to be like an original um, environment that it was. And so I guess the goal would be to make it better than it is right now. And, and that's where I think how we define that and data becomes really important. So increasing the number of, of protected areas, the area of those protected areas, um, increase in the abundance of particularly target species, increase people's appreciation. For, for nature and connection with nature and the people that are getting out there. And I think that's where it's getting back to the data. It's really important to have metrics. And I was, one thing that I think this, the, the strategy maybe could strengthen is I didn't find any data at all in the entire strategy or reference, direct reference to data. I saw appendices about 
many statements and other strategies and such. I know that the TRCA has a lot of baseline data already that will be the foundation of, of measuring whether we succeed. But I think that has to be ingrained from, you know, the, the, the strategy uh, indicates that it's important that uh, we are informed by data and making uh, data-informed decisions. Well, where's the data, <laughs> right? And unless we identify that now, I think we will have no basis in which to measure success, whether it be from a biodiversity perspective or how humans interact with that. Um, and so I think that's something that uh, needs to be a stronger part, part of the strategy. Absolutely. Cindy, one last I just, I just want to say, also with that, and when you look at how science and evidence, I'm referencing what you're saying, is that science and ev uh, evidence can support policy. I mean, it's really important to be transparent about that too, that I think, yes, TRCA has a lot of data and it's, it's, it's probably fantastic, but I don't think most of the people see that. Maybe most of us don't want to see it. I think some <laughs> of us in this room do, but um, you know, I think it's really important that it be out there and that when you monitor or measure that these numbers are available. And maybe, you know, if I look at some of some of my colleagues have been writing these documents of how, how science informs policy is that, you know, you have peer review, external peer review, like that's, I'm an academic, we go through that, you, you shudder whenever you have to put it out there and show other people, but it's good because it only makes it better. That's what peer review does. So I think being transparent and getting more input and external assessments uh, would add to that. Right, so the strategy almost as a baseline mm -hmm. and uh, certainly one that needs to be informed by baseline data, what we have and what we can move forward and try to aspire to. So, you know, that was really great. Thank you so much. I just want to do a quick round of applause before we get into the questions. Thank you very much, you guys, it was really great. Um, so at this point in the evening, uh, we, have, we still have uh, quite a lot of time. We're, we're doing really great for time. And what we'd like to do is open up the floor uh, to questions for our panelists here. Um, and we do have a microphone, I believe, going around. Um, I have a really hard time seeing people because it's very bright. Um, <coughs> and so I'm going to lean on Kelly with the microphone. Uh, yes. And uh, perhaps anybody who has a question. <laughs> we have one over here. Please. I, yes, great. I grabbed the mic first. Uh, I've got a very practical problem uh, that's going to crop up in the, I guess, require a resolution in about a year's time. I'm fortunate enough to overlook a little courtyard about, I guess, 2,000 square feet that has trees in it. Unfortunately, the trees exist in about four feet of soil, and beneath them is a parking garage. The result is leaks into the parking garage and uh, the question of what's going to replace, how we're going to improve our waterproofing, but then what are we going to do with that space? And so uh, the conflict, these trees have been wonderful. They've been there for 20 or 30 years. Some of them haven't made it and they've died. Some of them are fruit trees, uh, crab apple trees. Another is a row of cypresses. They provide habitat for birds, which is pretty, which is very much needed about 400 feet from Laura and Young. Um, so that's the situation. I'm just wondering, people who want to preserve biodiversity in a very urban setting, how do we resolve this conflict of drainage and trees? Sounds like a green roof question. Yes, actually, it does jump in. Moderator, but. You can jump in on that one. Yep, or if you well, uh, you know, <laughs> what can I say? It's uh, certainly a small area, and certainly uh, the the economic underpinnings potentially of the drainage issue could, uh, you know, far surpass what small benefits that area may provide for biodiversity. Certainly, you know, there's going to be ways to uh, interact with industry that would be able to deal with those uh, roofing issues, and certainly charge you to replace that roof, and certainly put all that substrate and the trees back, and I guess that would be the simplest answer that I could provide, that, that certainly you can have both. You know, we're at a, a, a degree of uh, integration of engineering and architecture and planning and horticulture and ecology and so on at this point now where if we want to put an oak tree on top of a building, we can do it, right? Uh, so my, my small comment to this point would be uh, that you could fix the roof and have the trees too. 
Just, just to add, add to that, though, so if it's not economically feasible, that you know you can have biodiversity without an oak tree, right? And so there can be smaller trees like the red buds that uh, Charlotte de Kaiser and Scott study, or smaller native native shrubs as well that are not going to permeate through the concrete, assuming that filling in your comment, assuming that filling in the, the garage is not an option. Uh, and having... I was hopeful. I was trying yeah. to be hopeful. Looking forward, you could make it smaller probably, right? But, you know, a, a prairie restoration, a or, there's a lot of different options there from the engineering option and just make it reinforced, and there's ways to do that, to picking other species that also increase the diversity in there as well. So, yeah, and I think, uh, again, I would echo these guys. You, you know, the short-term solution, you're probably going to lose some of those. Sometimes you can transplant or move, but in the long run, you're going to try and, it's going to be new engineering solutions is getting uh, more engaged in how to do this better. I don't, I don't know if we can help you immediately in the short term, but in the long term, you should, you can always have green space. And, and that, those, what has it been, 20 years or however long? Yeah, uh, we've benefited in the city from that. So if you're not going to fill it in, then put it back and maybe in a more, you know, that, that isn't going to be able to achieve the same height, but you'll still get a lot. Of, we, the city, will get lots of ecosystem services and benefits from it. Any other questions? There was another question there, yes. Well, they're pointing to this. Well, she was. No control. <laughs> Right. Should I take this? Okay. All right. Um, that's a great presentation by the panel and the moderator. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Uh, as a landscape architect, I'm working in the city and, and promoting biodiversity in my work. Um, but one of the questions I've been asking myself, and I'm not sure if the panel could um, provide some uh, advice on this or answers that other cities in the world have maybe looked at, but. As we achieve more success in this area, we will be uh, sharing our cities with more and more uh, species that uh, sometimes can cause challenges. You showed the raccoon. I've learned to live with raccoons in my uh, house, but if uh, a bear or a coyote uh, confronted one of my children or we've had this problem, we're not, we've had not this problem, but these challenges in the city already. And probably more northern cities have dealt with these uh, higher predators. So I'm wondering how, uh, as we uh, promote biodiversity in the cities, how we, or how other cities may have dealt with this uh, issue um, involving these kinds of, uh, I won't use the word, other species, other relatives or uh, teachers. Thank you. Do you want to answer that one? I, I'm, I personally am not familiar with any of the solutions. A nuisance species, we would probably label them like weeds, but um, I, and I don't, I don't know if that's actually fair. I think that um, <laughs> I, I want to make a facetious answer, like I did before, as you know, we we need to learn to control them at some level. I mean, the relationships we have with these other species good and bad, like the, the, they're not all good. They can't always, always be good. And so we learn, we have to learn to manage them. And I think that's a, a difficulty for us in cities is um, not being willing or able to intervene with strategies that maybe we are not as comfortable with. And it maybe goes back to what Peter was talking about herbicides, like that's an example where we have a problem, but we don't want the solution either, and so we're we're really caught. And it's really for people to kind of, uh, I guess, get more engaged in it. In the way they're they're disconnected from how species interact, and these species are a problem. So um, I'm not answering it very well. Well, I, I think what I would say, you know, that these conflicts you're talking about do arise frequently and in Boston we have wild turkeys you know in yeah. downtown Boston we have coyotes everywhere we have um, 
you know, the, the list is, and what, what re, what's really interesting to me about this is that, you know, the wildlife has come back without our permission. You know, we have, they are, they're coming, they do not need our help. You know, we have this idea that we've got to help nature come back and without our care and feeding, they're, they're, they're not going to make it. But in fact, wildlife is doing remarkably well. And there's a really interesting little Toronto story as I was doing my research on um, the Leslie Street Spit, you know, those double crested cormorants have, you know, really taken over that island, it, you know, and, and now people want to shoot them, you know, now people, oh, it's too, they're too successful, now we got to get rid of them because they're a problem, and here they are, a native species that has made an incredible comeback, and, up, oh, nope, too, that, you know, we can't have that, so, you know, you can't have it both ways, that's what I would say, you know, if you invite nature back, and nature comes back, you pretty much have to learn to deal with it, that's, But I know. think that is having it both ways in some ways, right? Right? And that, so I'd say it's three things. First of all, for the top predators, a lot of them already are here. Coyotes are quite abundant in, in the greater Toronto area, including in the Don Valley and the Humber, Humber River Valley. They're already here. In fact, they've changed their, their cycles, their diurnal cycles, to avoid humans as much as possible. And so you don't see them much because they're trying to avoid you, right? The second thing is, whenever possible, I think... <coughs> we should try to alter our behaviors. You know, it's not our fault that, or not their fault that we're here. The, the raccoons are native to the area. That's why we changed the way that we build all of the, the green bins and the, the garbage cans, right? So they can't get in there. And so I think that's the, the second thing. We try to change our behaviors. And, you know, they have black bears, they have cougars, they have lynx and bobcats further north than here. And they don't really have issues because they, they make more bear-proof dumpsters and such. But third, there will be some cases, the odd case, where they aren't compatible. So that moose that was running through Markham, I think that was last year, yeah. that's just not gonna work, right? right? Um, or a bear downtown Toronto, no. that's not gonna work. work right. And so th in those cases, there has to be management. But I think that's gonna be an exception if we accept that many of them are here. Two, we change our behaviors as much as possible, but when we can't, yes, there's certain things that aren't compatible with the city. And I would agree. I guess that's my immediate response, is that we're usually the ones who are way more disruptive than they are. Um, and the raccoons are way smarter than me at opening the green bin, so I wasn't <laughs> responsible for the green I mean, They're smarter than me. They're clever little hands. Um, like, okay, the dog had an encounter with the skunk in the park. Now, that's the skunk's park. And I accommodate my behavior and the dog <laughs> according to where the skunk is in the park. Um, so I think, yeah, we're the ones who, I think, have to yeah, modify. Um, that we actually have to manage ourselves a lot of, that's usually what manage, management is, is usually we're trying to manage ourselves most of the time, so as long as we know that, like, usually right. we're a bigger problem um, than whatever critter we have angst about. That's great. Thanks for that question. We had one down in the front here. Yes, hand up. There is. Thank you so much for that talk. All four of you are so cool. Uh, so I'm a landscape architect student, uh, and I, from what I've heard in all my theory classes, we're at a point where all of the world is a garden. So I'm really excited about your ideas that one of the solutions is all of us become better gardeners. Uh, and I'm especially excited about the idea of changing our ways that we design our front yards and backyards, because a lot of Toronto is just a single house on a quarter acre lot with a backyard and a front yard that look a lot like a miniature version of an English garden or a French garden. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like you said, wouldn't it be so nice if everyone could plant native trees and plants and it would probably have a huge impact on our city and problems with flooding and biodiversity. So what I'm wondering is in between this brilliant idea and actually turning that into policy and getting the public engaged, what are things that need to be measured or drawn or written to get that from an idea into a policy that residents might actually take up? The policy I'll leave to the people in the front row. <laughs> but when I was growing up, all of our waste, everything, went into one bin. And I remember people coming in and it got more and more and more and more intense of talking about recycling. We weren't talking about green bins yet, we were talking about recycling. And all the kids became very well versed in recycling. And then we told our parents about it. Now my parents are the best recyclers I've ever met. Because 
it started from the grassroots, starting with the kids, and then ta talking about it at home. And then we got into, into the, the waste management through green bins and, uh, and compost. And so I think if we start with the kids, we almost won't necessarily need the policy because they'll start talking about, wow, we can have these things in our yard if we plant this plant or that plant. We can have all these bees if we put a bee box and they don't even sting you, right? And I think through those small actions, and that's not a small action educating the youth about these things, but I think that's the, maybe the simplest and biggest impact thing you could do is mobilize a group of people to go into schools and tell them about the benefits of these things. And I think you'll be amazed by the impact, very rapid impact. And there's things that'll take a longer period of time. But if we have someone in a school, every single school, for one hour, wow, that would have a big change in one year. And you do that every year, and then you do it twice a year, we could change the city. Um, I was going to, well, I, I don't like to think of the world as a garden. Um, <laughs> it's the cosmopolitan, the garden thing. So, and I'm sorry to say that in landscape architecture, but um, uh, I, so if I distance myself from that, um, I think uh, I like to do it, uh, I like to think about the city through demonstration and you talk about educating and so I live across the street here, my front yard's about the size of this stage. And, you know, I haven't put the sign up yet, but it's an eastern temperate forest over there. <laughs> I'm running an experiment. And I guess to come back to the, uh, anyone can do it. And maybe through, you know, people walking down, I think at first they probably thought I'm just letting it go. Um, but I'm not gardening, but I am watching the, the mushrooms come in there, the trilliums. I've got a few and they're surviving. And, and so you start saying, oh, hopefully by example, other people will pick it up. I don't know in terms of the, the planning and the, the strategy of whether that can be brought in somehow, but it's, it's rewarding people or acknowledging, you know, the most natural garden instead of the garden that is the most beautiful garden um, or the most roses or the most bees or whatever it is, maybe it's the most natural woodland garden downtown. Um, this summer we did um, some walks up in the annex and there's some lot more land than I have that is very much connected with Tattle, the buried Tattle Creek, or is it Cat Garrison Creek or Cat Tattle Creek? Just amazing what can be done on a little plot of land. So I think it's being inspired and in showing other people what can happen. It doesn't all have to be roses. No, and I, the only thing I would add is that there, in my experience, there are gardening cultures out there. The, the British are certainly a gardening culture. The, the Japanese are gardening culture. And some of the, there's been some amazing research uh, from England showing the, the contribution that these small uh, backyard gardens have made to the overall biodiversity for the entire country of England. I mean, it's staggering once a, a, a culture embraces gardening culture, which didn't say they don't have lots of natural areas. So I think in an urban context, the gardens have an incredibly important role potentially to play. And how do you jumpstart that? And, you know, how do you get people to become more involved in gardening? And, you know, for most people, starting with the vegetables is the way to go. You know, if you eat it, you know, that's, that's a good motivation for growing it. And, you know, you start there and you just work your way up to, you know, annuals, perennials, roses, Eastern deciduous Eastern trees, <laughs> and then the conifers, you know, that's the, that's the ultimate <laughs> stage, uh, you know, but it's a, it's a long, slow process, and it's, you start with kids, and then, you, then it goes down the other end, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of deadwood I think the only thing that I would add to that is, again, to be really thoughtful about the social justice kind of orientation to this, because not everyone, well, most people don't yeah, own a home, true. and most people don't have a front and backyard, so... How do you engage um, what's going to be a collective space and how are you going to foster those kind of um, relationships? So I think that's uh, an important part to not forget about as well. But, but also to identify, if I can add to that, the places that do do a good job at allowing everyone to come together and, and contribute to that. So in, in my backyard, I live out in Mississauga, and we have the Riverwood Nature Conservancy. And there, they're... Um, the tenants for them or their vision is trying to connect people with horticulture 
uh, nature and restoration. And there they have lots of kids that are coming in uh, and doing gardening or pulling out garlic mustard. And they also have an enabling garden where children with any form of mobility, so at any level, can engage with the garden and actually plant plants. And that has a huge impact. And all kids from Mississauga are going here from their schools, either the, the um, Peel District School Board or the, the uh, Catholic District School Board, as well as a number of private schools. So I think these types of things, I don't know all of the opportunities in Toronto, but I know they exist. And I think identifying where other people can get to and educating them, hey, if you don't have your own yard, Here's where you can go and get involved with those I, things. I think that's so critical, given that more families with children than not live in apartments or condos in the city mm -hmm. of Toronto. And so having these public spaces where people can engage meaningfully uh, with gardening and outreach and so on is quite critical. And that should probably be more part of the strategy, is trying to create these outlets for people, recognizing that it's, this city is becoming less and less affordable for, for many people. That's right. Uh, do we have any other other questions? There's one right here. There's one at the back of the right, too. Hi, okay, so as you, I actually had a question about common spaces and community gardens, because I think those are such an, a great opportunity, but they pose a lot of challenges, especially in terms of like, oh, in terms of creating accessibility and ownership, because we see a lot of different parties at play, including not just stakeholders, but then the government and nonprofit groups that are there to help organize. So what does an ideal government, like governance structure for these common spaces look like to you guys to then create not only access for everyone, but also an idea of ownership and longevity for people who partake in them. So I'll, I'll speak to, to Riverwood Conservancy. It's a charity that's supported by the city of Mississauga in that case. And so, and the charity, although it has a staff, has hundreds of volunteers. So the community really takes ownership on that land and engaging people with it. And, for every school group that comes in, there'll be at least one staff member, but then there'll be several volunteers that are also helping um, push wheelchairs or helping the children actually get um, uh, situated in, from, in front of the enabling garden or going on spirit journey with the, um, the elders that we have that come there as well. So uh, I think having the community take ownership that, through that, through a charity and through volunteers is really empowering, as opposed to it coming top down, which often doesn't work very well. But if they support this initiative, that can really build a lot of synergy. I was just going to say, well, I did whisper, I don't do governance, but, <laughs> and, and, but now that you put it that way, Mark, that's exactly, I mean, I've worked with many communities in the city on developing these urban forest management plans, but more importantly, as a community member, uh, there's so many of them here, and it's so clear that you get a lot more accomplished almost bottom up. You hope that it meets top down at some point in some way in a, a good way, so I don't know from the governance how it goes into the plan, but it, it happens at a local level, and I think that's why I talked about place before, because people really identify my community, Spadina to Bathurst, Bloor to College, they have a real strong vision of who they are. And because we don't have parks in this place, some people, some communities are lucky they have these green spaces and, and large parks. Our community says we don't have a park, our whole community is a park. It includes all the backyards. And so that's how they come at the world, and it's a community bottom-up thought about how you make decisions. Um, you can't control each other's private land, but you can, it, it's incredible peer pressure, the influence of comparing notes with your neighbor. These are all really good points too as we start to think about the Lower Dawn and creating those urban commons. So much of what we heard about the existing green spaces and supporting these kinds of initiatives, we do have opportunities in a city like Toronto to actually create them at the development stage, right? Right at the uh, design and developing uh, point. So anyway, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, it's one in the very back. Right there. in the very back, yes. Hi, I just wanted to thank all of you for, it was a great panel. Um, I have technically recently left my teenage years. Um, <laughs> I come from a different perspective. Um, and something that I've uh, learned a lot about and experienced through me, my friends, my siblings, my siblings' friends, as well as being a camp counselor, 
um, is this idea and this concept of nature deficit disorder, oh, um, which right. uh, I've been learning about and I find really interesting, especially what you guys were talking about with engaging with the kids. And I kind of want to see what your solutions or ideas about um, these, uh, well, de nature deficit disorder as well as, well, why would I build a garden when I can buy a piece four and just sit on that all day? Or like, what is this pushing force for this engagement? Like, you can say all you want, well, we're, everyone's gonna have a garden, everyone's gonna have a forest, but like, where is this experience coming from? And what, like, what is that pushing force? Like, I have friends who are like, ew, worms, and like, they're 20, 23 years old, right? Like, um, <laughs> So it's not, I think, what I'm trying to say is how do you engage only the kids as well as the teenagers and the adolescents um, and maybe possibly through this biodiversity strategy? Free range kids. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, you know, and I'm gonna take a stab at answering this and I'm sure it's not gonna sit well with my fellow panelists, but um, <laughs> I think one of the things that's in, so I wrote this book, it's a field guide to, you know, spontaneous urban vegetation, you know, featuring dandelions and, you know, mugwort, all the things that, you know, people love to hate. And the philosophy behind the book is that, you know, you start with the plants that are in your front yard that you when you step out of your house that's growing in the crack of the sidewalk and if you can get people to pay attention to that and to think about that then you've you've opened the door a crack to beginning to understand nature and if you can learn the name of that plant then you can begin to have the first stages of a relationship with that plant so when you're working with children you have to work with what is in front of them and, and whether it's native or non-native, that's totally irrelevant. You know, the oxide daisy is the most fascinating plant in the world to a child. You know, and so I think it's really this idea that, oh, you know, the, the native plants are superior to it. That's a much higher order of experience and thinking. And so if you really want to engage children in it, you have to embrace the world that exists outside their front door. And that's that's the educational approach that I take. Uh, you know, I took it with my own kids. And, you know, I think it, it works with children, but it means accepting these things as part of our environment. What about teens, though? What? Three-year-olds that go, ew, and they see a worm. That's her <laughs> question. What do, you, what do you do with them? Well, it's hard. 23-year-olds <laughs> are like, you know, they're already like a little old. Uh, you know? <laughs> it's already it's, uh, well, I won't say that, but it is, uh, you know, getting your hands dirty. You know, teenagers hate getting their hands dirty. I work with teenagers. It's like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. But with little kids, it's, you know, it's a totally different thing. I, I don't know. I haven't had that much success working with 23-year-olds. <laughs> Did you want it? So I, I've got two, two things. Number one, take the devices away. There you go. <laughs> not a 23-year-old. Well, certainly for the three-year-old. You don't have a 23-year-old. <laughs> They're getting there. Clearly. And, and, and second, well, give the 23-year-old to me for an hour, um, and we'll, we'll see where we get. But I think we really need a youth movement. And I think this is something that is potentially the most important thing. If we want to confront what's happening right now, where most people don't respect diversity, biodiversity, 82% of Canadians live in cities, and it's getting harder and harder for them to contact nature. And so I think we need, in every community, a junior young naturalist program. The Toronto Field Naturalist just started one uh, here that's running. We've just started one in Peel. There's only about half a dozen in all of Ontario. And they should be everywhere. They should be more common than Scouts Canada and Girl Guides Canada if we really want to address this. So I think, if, I think we have the potential to create a youth movement across the country and across the world if we kind of start it here. And I think that would really have a positive impact after you take away the device. I mean, for me in teaching, so maybe I teach roughly that age, um, yeah, including graduate school. 
So one of the things that um, in trying to get people to under, because one of the things I try to do is get people to understand their relationship to environment, because that's a, a big thing with me. Cause we all have one, but probably a lot of it's pretty dysfunctional. So even if they own up to that, so asking people what kind of relationship that they have, and then when they really think about it, because you do it privately and then we could share it later, um, to, and then people start to think about it a lot more. So you're kind of stuck doing that in the classroom. But one of the things I do at every single class I teach and it totally freaks them out at first is I make them go outside. And yeah, say, yeah, that's go a, outside, doesn't that's matter. A scary thing. <laughs> Whether, like, I'll be teaching a course in January, they're going to have to do it in January. The fall course went when it was actually um, like 45 degrees. Like, it was a really hot, hot, humid day. Because uh, what I was trying to get through to them was that you can learn. Like, there's these, these senses that you can learn from. And go outside, go for a walk, and, and then. And I didn't let them write, because they want to write down, they want instructions, they're trying to write it on their hands. So I have these questions that they have that I actually, because I want them to embody what it's like to be outside. You're not going to forget this crazy teacher who made you go outside when it was 40 degrees Celsius, because you know it was so friggin' hot. And so you start to embody what it's actually like to be outside. Go figure out what the trees are telling you. Like they, so they, a lot of them, so you know, some people can't handle that, but some of them do. They're like, I have no idea what's happening. I'm going, there is a method to my madness, because then we do it throughout the year. And they start to learn how to pay attention to their senses and that a lot of the learning is actually embodied. Um, so, so that is something that I get students to do and generally they've been pretty cooperative about that. Uh, and actually they do it better when they're younger. So if I was teaching first year, 17, 18 year olds, they're better at it. The older they get, the more reserved they get. And they keep thinking I'm wanting a right answer to this. I'm like, I can't embody your experience. So those are the things that I actually do. It doesn't matter whether I'm teaching law or whether I'm teaching in environmental studies or whether I'm teaching research or whatever, I make them do that um, to get them to think about that. And then we go back and, and discuss it. And then they have to do a reflection on what their relationship was and what they understood. And even if it's nothing, even if they go, I didn't get anything out of this, I go, that tells you something about your relationship to the natural world. And um, so that's still really helpful for people to know because they don't even think about it. But at least I thought about it and said, I don't have anything. It's really dysfunctional. I'm a consumer. And I'm like, at least you know that. Like, and you're owning up to it, and you know, and what, do, how, what kind of journey are we going to go on to try to deal with that? So that's that. My experience is in the teaching environment. So that's what I would say. That's one well, of the ways that it, I try to do that. You know, what's funny about that is you're saying, you know, if you want kids to learn about nature, you've got to take them outside. Right outside. Obviously, you know. And what's interesting <laughs> about, um, you know, I've taught in the landscape architecture programs for a number of years, and over that time, I've watched how computer, how the digital medium has taken over the outdoor experience and substituted for it in the training of the professional landscape architecture. So it's gotten over the time harder and harder for me to find the time to get the students outside. And you know, more and more students think that that digital experience is just as good as the real experience. And I see that as a, as a real you know, tragedy because there's no substitute for going outside, uh, it, period. You can't, you, know, you can't do it on the computer. So so I, I really agree with you on that. So we have one final out there point from Sam. Out there? Well, I, I said I, I'm, uh, I agree with my colleagues where they've addressed it. I don't know if I can help in the landscape architecture world, but and it's rather a draconian uh, idea. But I've always felt many countries have mandatory military service for 17-year-olds, and I've always felt in forestry that if we sent every 17-year-old in Canada up north to plant trees or out west or wherever it was <laughs> for the summer, they would come back with a whole different sense of what it is to be in nature. And I think, I don't think it would scare them, uh, although some might hate it. They could never say they didn't have a relationship. They it would be quite clear. True. It may be a short-term relationship, <laughs> but I think they would come and think about the world a little differently, certainly the country. So that's out there. So, so how we fit that into the biodiversity strategy, I'll yeah. leave that up to the city. <laughs> um, but listen, with that, we're at time. And so I really want to thank everybody for coming out uh, midweek to uh, engage with this biodiversity strategy exercise. I really want to thank the panelists, of course, for providing lots of really interesting perspectives, certainly turning biodiversity kind of inside out and upside down, and hopefully that will inform a little bit about how the city proceeds with the strategy. Um, certainly, uh, there will be many other ways in which you may be able to engage with the city uh, in, in terms of uh, engaging with your own experience or other questions or comments you may have, and we look forward to that. So with that, thank you very much for coming out, and have a great night. Okay.